Study 3. Pruning Trees. Fundamental Principles. Trees are very much like human beings in their requirements, mode of life, and diseases, and the general principles applicable to the care of one are equally important to the intelligent treatment of the other. The removal of limbs from trees, as well as from human beings, must be done sparingly and judiciously. Wounds in both trees and human beings must be disinfected and dressed to keep out all fungus or disease germs. Fungus growths of trees are similar to human cancers, both in the manner of their development and the surgical treatment which they require. Improper pruning will invite fungi and insects to the tree, hence the importance of a knowledge of fundamental principles in this branch of tree care. Time. Too much pruning at one time should never be practiced, and no branch should be removed from a tree without good reason for so doing. Dead and broken branches should be removed as soon as observed, regardless of any special pruning season, because they are dangerous, unsightly, and carry insects and disease into the heart of the tree. But all other pruning, whether it be for the purpose of perfecting the form in shade trees or for increasing the production of fruit in orchard trees, should be confined to certain seasons. Shade and ornamental trees can best be pruned in the fall, while the leaves are still on the tree, and while the tree itself is in practically a dormant state. Proper cutting. All pruning should be commenced at the top of the tree and finished at the bottom. A shortened branch, excepting in poplars and willows, which should be cut in closely, should terminate in small twigs, which may draw the sap to the freshly cut wound. Where a branch is removed entirely, the cut should be made close, and even with the trunk. Wherever there is a stub left after cutting off a branch, the growing tissue of the tree cannot cover it, and the stub eventually decays, falls out, and leaves a hole, which serves to carry disease and insects to the heart of the tree. This idea of close cutting cannot be overemphasized. Where large branches have to be removed, the splitting and ripping of the bark along the trunk is prevented by making one cut beneath the branch about a foot or two away from the trunk, and then another above close to the trunk. Too severe pruning. In pruning trees, many people have a tendency to cut them back so severely as to remove everything but the bare trunk and a few of the main branches. This process is known as heading back. It is a method, however, which should not be resorted to except in trees that are very old and failing, and even there only with certain species, like the silver maple, sycamore, linden, and elm. Trees like the sugar maple will not stand this treatment at all. The willow is a tree that will stand the process very readily, and the Carolina poplar must be cut back every few years in order to keep its crown from becoming too tall, scraggy, and unsafe. Covering Wounds The importance of immediately covering all wounds with coal tar cannot be overstated. If the wound is not tarred, the exposed wood cracks, providing suitable quarters for disease germs that will eventually destroy the body of the tree. Coal tar is by far preferable to paint and other substances for covering the wound. The tar penetrates the exposed wood, producing an antiseptic as well as protective effect. Paint only forms a covering which may peel off in course of time and which will later protrude from the cut, thus forming, between the paint and the wood, a suitable breeding place for the development of destructive fungi or disease. The application of tin covers, burlap, or other bandages to the wound is equally futile and in most cases even injurious. Tools used in pruning. Good tools are essential for quick and effective work in pruning. Two or three good saws, a pair of pole shears, a pole saw, a 16-foot single ladder, a 40-foot extension ladder of light spruce or pine with hickory rungs, a good pruning knife, plenty of coal tar, a fire can to heat the tar, a pole brush, a small hand brush, and plenty of good rope comprise the principal equipment of the pruner. Study 4. Tree Repair Where trees have been properly cared for from their early start, wounds and cavities and their subsequent elaborate treatment have no place. But where trees have been neglected or improperly cared for, wounds and cavities are bound to occur and early treatment becomes a necessity. There are two kinds of wounds on trees. One, surface wounds which do not extend beyond the inner bark, and two, deep wounds or cavities which may range from a small hole in a crotch to the hollow of an entire trunk. Surface wounds. Surface wounds are due to bruised bark, and a tree thus injured can no longer produce the proper amount of foliage or remain healthy very long. The reason for this becomes very apparent when one looks into the nature of the living or active tissue of a tree and notes how this tissue becomes affected by such injuries. This living or active tissue is known as the cambium layer, and is a thin tissue situated immediately under the bark. It must completely envelop the stem, root, and branches of the trees. The outer bark is a protective covering to this living layer, while the entire interior wood tissue chiefly serves as a skeleton or support for the tree. The cambium layer is the real active part of the tree. It is the part which transmits the sap from the base of the tree to its crown. It is the part which causes the tree to grow by formation of new cells, piled up in the form of rings around the heart of the tree. And it is also the part which prevents the entrance of insects and disease to the inner wood. From this it is quite evident that any injury to the bark, and consequently to this cambium layer, alongside of it, will not only cut off a portion of the sap supply and hinder the growth of the tree to an extent proportional to the size of the wound, but will also expose the inner wood to the action of decay. 
The wound may at first appear insignificant, but if neglected, it will soon commence to decay and thus to carry disease and insects into the tree. The tree then becomes hollow and dangerous, and its life is doomed. Injury to the cambium layer, resulting in surface wounds, may be due to the improper cutting of a branch, to the bite of a horse, to the cut of a knife, or the careless wielding of an axe, to the boring of an insect, or to the decay of a fungus disease. Whatever the cause, the remedy lies in cleaning out all decayed wood, removing the loose bark, and covering the exposed wood with coal tar. In cutting off the loose bark, the edges should be made smooth before the coal tar is applied. Loose bark, put back against a tree, will never grow, and will only tend to harbor insects and disease. Bandages, too, are hurtful because underneath the bandage, disease will develop more rapidly than where the wound is exposed to sun and wind. The application of tin or manure to wounds is often indulged in and is equally injurious to the tree. The secret of all wound treatment is to keep the wound smooth, clean to the live tissue, and well covered with coal tar. The chisel or gouge is the best tool to employ in this work. A sharp hawk-billed knife will be useful in cutting off the loose bark. Coal tar is the best material for covering wounds because it has both an antiseptic and protective effect on the wood tissue. Paint, which is very often used as a substitute for coal tar, is not as effective because the paint is apt to peel in time, thus allowing moisture and disease to enter the crevice between the paint and the wood. Cavities Deep wounds and cavities are generally the result of stubs that have been permitted to rot and fall out. Surface wounds allowed to decay will deepen in the course of time and produce cavities. Cavities in trees are especially susceptible to the attack of disease because, in a cavity, there is bound to exist an accumulation of moisture. With this, there is also considerable darkness and protection from wind and cold, and these are all ideal conditions for the development of disease. The successful application of a remedy in all cavity treatment hinges on this principal condition, that all traces of disease shall be entirely eliminated before treatment is commenced. The chisel, gouge, maul, and knife are the tools, and it is better to cut deep and remove every trace of decayed wood than it is to leave a smaller hole in an unhealthy state. The inner surface of the cavity should then be covered with a coat of white lead paint, which acts as a disinfectant and helps to hold the filling. A coat of coal tar over the paint is the next step. The cavity is then solidly packed with bricks, stones, and mortar, and finished with a layer of cement at the mouth of the orifice. 